Hello, hello. Nice to have you with us once again. Talking about uh, the F word, I think it's only the second show we've done involving that particular word on uh, Mansfield's Money Sense. This time though, relating to fraud in the banking sector. We welcome into the studio Elsa Smuts, who's Head of Marketing at FNB Core Banking Solutions, Kaliani Pillo, who is CEO of Sabric, and joining us from our bureau in Cape Town, Ian Duvenacher, the Principal Consultant for Africa for Frost and Sullivan. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Kaliani, firstly, let's get this out of the way. Sabric, I can see a whole lot of people going, who, what do they do? Sure. What do you do? Sabric is a South African banking risk information center. It's a company that was established by the banks, the major banks in South Africa about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's predominantly been established to help the banks find organized crime within the banking and the cash and transit industries. So we're there to help the banks catch the big the bad guys. So you like the sort of FBI of the banks? Well, we don't, we don't do investigations, but we support the police with their investigations and the prosecution uh, with their prosecutions as well. Do yeah. you have, for want of a better word, a whole load of informants? So you, are you on the ground trying to find information and gather information as well? No, that, that's predominantly the domain of the police. But what we do is we help them. We, we sit with a central repository of data with regard to all crime um, risk and all crime incidents that take place. So uh, Sabric sits at, at, and at any given time we are able to uh, give a report or um, an assessment of what's happening in the banking sector. So while each bank will know what their position is, what their, uh, in inverted commas, market share of the crime type is, Sabric will always know what it's like in terms of the industry. And this is done particularly to help the banks deal with the risk that crime poses to a particular bank. I would imagine that they, they banks, as in any business, would not want to give too much information to their opposition, but I suppose in this particular case, they have to share that collective property to protect themselves as a as as a as a as a as a business. Sure, you know, you know, Jeremy. One of the things that's really quite unique about the South African setup is is the Sabric model. The South African banks have actually come together as competitors, but are collaborating in the fight against crime because they know that they're actually chasing the same target. It's the same syndicates and the same groups that are actually targeting all of the banks and I think that's one of the uniqueness of the South African model is to actually work as you know in, and collaborate to try and fight crime and it's actually been extremely effective and I must say that we are quite proud as South Africans because we're finding that a number of countries are actually wanting to now follow the model and we are interacting with a number of people to share. Ilsa is this this problem on, on the rise? Uh, we've actually seen very strong growth in our account numbers, yet our fraud numbers are stable. So on a percentage basis, it's actually declining, which is fantastic. I think the main reason for that is behind the scenes, a lot of work is being done at the bank, but also together with Sabric um, and also the card associations and so. So um, lots of software and so that will help us look at things um, and analyze and see if there are any unusual transactions. If we see, for example, somebody is doing a transaction, let's say in London, and an hour later they're doing a transaction in Toronto we know that's not possible so we would phone the client proactively and say listen this doesn't look right um, was this your transaction and then they would confirm and then we can cancel that card proactively apart from that lots of innovation so we would send clients SMS's to say you know these transactions have gone through on your account so if they get a transaction SMS that where they haven't performed the transaction they can immediately say whoa that wasn't me and they can proactively cancel their cards I have, I have noticed in the last uh, probably 18 months, a year to 18 months, that my particular bank has changed the method of how they interact with me when I'm wanting to do an EFT, for example. They've changed it about twice in the last 18 months. Is, is, is this part of the, the whole ro the rollout of... of, of soft new software and that sort of stuff yeah I think constantly we will look at trends and if we see there's a way that we need to maybe change something we will de definitely do that to continue to protect our clients so yeah the, the, cl the criminals are obviously also they're in business um, and they want to keep ahead of you know what they want to continue to make their money so they keep um, investigating and innovating on their side and we have to stay one step ahead all the time and we put a lot of energy and effort in that but what I must say is the best way to prevent this firstly very simple um, 
uh, most of the card fraud or other frauds are highly preventable. Um, but the best way to do that is to have a very, very alert and vigilant cli um, client and card holder on our side. And for that reason, we do a lot of work to inform people. From an F&B point of view, we have an annual card security week to say to people, these are the tips, this is how you do it. But are Simple people things. actually aware of of this. Ian, I'm coming to you in a moment. I'm not ignoring you just because you're in Cape Town. Okay, I promise you. But it, are, are we... Uh, uh, people are aware of it, but what happens, as Ilsa said, you know, the, the, the perpetrators of this kind of crime, they are such great strategists and they're constantly on the on the alert to whatever new developments the banks are actually bringing in to, to, to ensure that they close the gaps. And the banks are pretty good in terms of doing that. But they also, they follow all the solutions that the banks provide so that they look for ways to compromise it. Now, the, the greater risk lies, unfortunately, with the bank client. It lies in each of us, within our hands. And so people have to be vigilant and people have to follow the rules. You know, the banks make ba try to make banking as accessible uh, and as easy for people as possible so that you could do it from your home, you could do it from any part of the world that you're in. But at the end of the day, you still need to make sure that you have great antivirus software on your computers, that you protect yourself, that you don't go into an internet cafe and use a computer that's not familiar to you. You're not sure whether there's a key logging device that's on there that's recording your number. So it's that kind of vigilance that's absolutely vital because unfortunately the perpetrators are now forcing each one of us to uh, do banking differently, to be extra careful. And I think that's the important thing because they if you look at phishing as an example where they try to solicit personal information uh, from uh, uh, bank clients so that they can then purport to be that person you'll find that the kinds of, of, of emails that go out or the kind of SMS's that go out to solicit that information uh, changes all the time. In the early times, it would be badly written. There'd be spe spelling errors. Oh, now they're even using they, brand so names yes, of South African the banks. Logos the logos are and identical. I think the and only way you can tell it is by the email address. Yes, but, but the important thing is that don't ever respond. I mean, it's an absolute not negotiable. Yeah. Ian, I would imagine your your area of expertise is probably the most difficult one at this stage because. Uh, you, you're in the mobile banking area, um, and, and that must be fraught with possible problems. I, I think it's a little bit of a catch-22, because um, as mobile banking are trying to reduce cost of consumer transactions, obviously banks are spending more on fraud prevention, and that kind of offsets the, the cost reduction in mobile banking. Um, and and it, is, it is a channel that's, that's widely used, and obviously then it would be quite a targeted area for, for criminals as well. Would you say, and this is a, a horrible generalization, but sometimes you can make them, would you say that you've got two distinct sectors in that mobile medium? The one is your, let's call them, unsavvy banking person who is doing mobile banking because they are in a remote area of the country, for example, but they're not aware of the risks of it. And then you've got your very savvy youngster, your, your urban youngster who knows everything about mobiles because that's his whole life. You take that mobile out of his hand and to start <laughs> having an absolute frothy. Um, and and how, do you, how do you cater for both of those very distinct, distinctly different markets? I think it is just in, in keeping it simple, uh, I think the biggest challenge isn't just in the actual security because there's, there's the two distinct ones, but I think if you look at your, at your savvy market, they're not just using the mobile banking platform, they're also using um, some of the Facebook integration that some of the banks are doing recently, um, the mixed integration of, of payments, so they're using payment mechanisms through a mobile platform all the time. I think on the banking platform um, it's a little bit simpler because it is fairly standard, you could, can put quite a structured procedure in place to, to mitigate the risk. But when you start interacting with all sorts of other um, companies, websites, online, that's kind of when um, it starts getting a lot more tricky. I suppose it, it would be the same because your area of expertise is, is a check and, and credit card fraud. That's right. Um, I suppose you could really relate the same problems there as well because I know my, my late father and my, my mother um, were, they, they were absolutely gobsmacked when this, this ATM thing came out where you have to go up and 
where, where do you put your numbers in? Mm -hmm. So you've got that generation who haven't grown up with it, and my generation who have grown up with credit cards. Um, I'm not as au fait with the mobile sector because that is the next generation, I think. But I suppose you have that distinct problem as well in, in your area. I think in every generation has their preferred way of banking yeah. and um, for each one of them there's a key to your account. Maybe in the olden days when you wrote checks then your signature would be that key and people would forge your, your signature and that would become a problem. Um, luckily now with the help of technology and so on I think we're just in a better position to see trends quickly and to identify incidents so much quickly or uh, so faster and you know and just in general it's again it's uh, you have to be alert you have to keep your pen and your cards and your, your access um, passwords to, to online banking and to mm. banking apps and all of those things very, very safe. It's like the keys of your car or your house. You're not going to leave it um, lying around. You're not going to give it to somebody else to use. Um, you, you have to treat it because it literally gives the person access to all your money. And I think sometimes people are, especially I think when you're like on holiday or you have a different kind of routine to your normal routine or you may be in a bit of a hurry, people don't pay as much attention. Mm. And I think the biggest um, place where um, there's an opportunity for fraudsters to make, for example, counterfeit cards and, and do a, a shoulder surfing is at an ATM because people are easily distracted and um, we're in a way a helpful nation. So if you're struggling a bit, somebody might say, oh, I'll quickly help you. And you think, oh, that's fantastic. This person is so, so friendly, but then they might be distracting you, swapping your card, looking at your pin. Um, and those are the things that are so easily um, you know, prevented. You can just check that you get your own card back from the ATM. And when you do put in your pin, always cover the pin pad with, with your hand. Um, and then it's basically impossible to, to, to get your money. But I think we have to be not paranoid, but very vigilant and um, mm. proactive about that. And we, you can't be too naive. Um, so often when I even see people um, shopping and they pay for their goods with their cards, you know, in, at the till, um, they happily just press in the, 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 the pen and you, you can't do that. There's always somebody watching and it, it's, it's just dangerous. And I think just the, the trend is that people are moving away from cash um, quite a bit. So card usage is, um, mm. is getting, the, the trend is just that it's increasing a lot. And it certainly is a much safer way of transacting than cash. It's generally also cheaper and you, it's easier for you to, to budget. You can see what you spend your money on, but you have to be um, careful because people know if they have that card and that pin they basically have endless access to your to your account there's there's another th there's another aspect here that uh, I'd like to get into at some in, in, in the ne next part of the show um, and that is people are, are now starting to have multiple accounts you, you know in in the past people had one bank they had mm. maybe two two accounts a current account and a savings account mm. um, you now have your offshore bank you have uh, a bond or a mortgage on a on an offshore property with another bank you have your bank here you you have an investment bank sure. and we're all over the place I honestly have got to a stage where I've had, had to get one of those little ABC thing you think of McGuadges and write down all my passwords in it and pin numbers because otherwise I will forget them because there, there are so many you know, and we, as we become more of a carded society, um, I think that's wh where it's going to go. I also want to get more into the mobile side of it with uh, Ian Duvinar and see where the trends are and uh, I I in the fraud itself. What, what sort of fraud are, are we identifying that's coming through? This is a fascinating subject. Please don't go away. We'll be back in just a moment.